Welcome to Glendale First United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Chris Tate, and I'm so happy that you've joined us for worship today. It's my hope that every time we gather together, whether it's in person or if you're watching online, that you'll experience God's presence, that you'll come to know or grow in your faith in Jesus Christ, and that together we might be able to make Christ's difference in the world. I do want you to know that if you're looking for ways to get engaged here at Glendale First, uh, that we do have a number of opportunities that are happening right now. Uh, if you're watching this on Sunday, October 2nd, uh, you should know that on Monday, tomorrow the 3rd, that we are going to be having our next trip to go and help serve breakfast at North Valley Caring Services. And if you'd like to know more about that, you can look at the description below. We also have a number of Bible studies and different opportunities that are available over Zoom. So if you're not in the Glendale area, there's still ways that you can participate. And there are numerous other activities going on and coming up. And if you'd like to know more about those, you can follow the links below or go to our website, glendalefirst.org. So with that, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, wherever we are, whatever it is we have going on in our lives, we take this time to pause and to be open to you. And so we ask that, that you would speak to us this day, that you would help us to better know who you are and who you desire us to be. And so gracious God, speak during this time of worship and may we be open and able to be able to receive. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray, amen. Our gospel reading for today is from Luke 19 verses one through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we are continuing in the Gospel according to Luke. And for those of you who've been with us, I commend you for sticking with us because we've been doing this for a number of weeks and even months now. But my hope is, is that in doing this and by following the story of Jesus's life as one author is telling us, that hopefully you're beginning to pick up and see the continuity that there is in the story and that understanding that in the Bible and the accounts that we have of Jesus's life that we consider, uh, that we call the gospel, which literally means good news, that it's not just these little snippets as we often receive them, a parable here, a story there, those sorts of things. But in looking at it over time, that we've been able to see the continuity, the themes that have been present throughout this gospel, and we'll do this as we go forward in the other gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and John. And with that, being able to see that there are things that the author is helping to teach us, helping us to understand and appreciate about who Jesus is, about who God is, and about who God seeks to be for us. And so with that, as we again continue in Luke, uh, we pick up in chapter 19 in a story that Pastor Stephanie just read for us about a tax collector named Zacchaeus. I don't know about you, but I can't help but hear the name Zacchaeus and think about the Vacation Bible School song, Zacchaeus was a wee little, I won't sing the song for you, I won't trouble you or burden you with my singing. Um, but that's the story we're talking about, about the man named Zacchaeus who wasn't just a tax collector, but he was a chief tax collector. And we talked a lot about tax collectors last week, but just as a refresher, it's the idea that, that Rome who occupied, who controlled this part of the world, because of conquering it with their military, um, that, that they still controlled it. And so because of that, they would tax the people who lived in this land and they taxed them pretty severely. And the way they would collect the taxes is that whoever the, the head person was that was in charge, that they would auction off these licenses to other people who would go and collect the taxes for them. 
And if you purchase one of these licenses, you would be permitted or allowed, if you so desired, to collect whatever taxes above that that you wanted to. And then what you collected above it uh, would be basically the profit that you made. And so when it says that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, uh, he was one of these people that had a lot of tax collectors working underneath him. So he could have been the one who was selling the licenses. He could have been one who bought a large number of these licenses and then sold them on to other people. But wherever Zacchaeus is in that sort of structure, it's that he's a higher up individual. And because of this, which is not so surprising, people didn't like him. I mean, people not only saw him as one of the people who were contributing to uh, Rome's success, but also that, that he was a key figure in the midst of it. So in this story, as Jesus is continuing, again, in what we know as the travel narrative, he's getting extremely close to Jerusalem. At this point, he will arrive in Jerusalem by the end of chapter 19. And he's now in a place called Jericho, which is a large city that's about 90 miles outside of Jerusalem. It's still a long way, but as far as Luke's telling the story, it's the last major stop before he gets there. And so with this, a lot of people know about Jesus. Word has spread far and wide. And so people are excited about him. They're excited about him coming. They're excited about what they believe he's going to do. And not just people who think he's going to come and overturn uh, the Roman occupation, but people who are appreciating what he's saying, people who are becoming followers of his. And so the movement has largely grown at this point. So when Jesus is in Jericho, there's a large crush of people that are coming to see him, uh, huge crowds, and Zacchaeus is among them. He wants to see Jesus, uh, but as the scripture tells us, Zacchaeus isn't very tall. And so um, with there being just a big crush of people, I mean, this isn't like a parade we would think about today where there'd be, uh, you know, sort of the the cone set up or whatever it is. If you think of the Rose Bowl parade uh, where everybody's sort of segregated off to the side and there are the, you know, the platforms and stands and things like that. That's not what we're talking about at all. It's Jesus walking down what is likely not a very wide street anyway, because of course they didn't have cars or anything like that to force them to widen them. And people would have been crushing in. They would have been all around Jesus. And so if you were a person like Zacchaeus, who wasn't very tall, you're not going to be able to see him. So what Zacchaeus does is he climbs up in a sycamore tree, again, the song lyrics, um, to see him. And we may think, oh, okay, that's, that's not really an important fact. But In that day and age, in that culture, which was an honor and shame culture, uh, which had, um, what that means is, is that how you presented yourself had a big impact on how you were seen by others. There were very rigid expectations about what people could and couldn't do, especially people who were of a certain social standing. So for example, if you were an older man, um, there were certain things that you just didn't do because to do them would be undignified. It would embarrass you, it would bring shame upon you and shame upon other people around you. A lot of those things were things that were seen as childlike. So adult men didn't run, they didn't climb, they didn't do these things. And so what Luke is telling us here by Zacchaeus being willing to climb the tree, It's that he didn't really care what other people thought about him. He didn't care about embarrassing himself. He didn't care about bringing shame upon himself in the eyes of others because he wanted to see Jesus. I mean, if you think back to the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, you'll remember where it says that the father is waiting at the edge of the property, looking out and hoping that the younger son returns. And when he sees him, he runs to him. He runs to him and throws his arms around him and kisses him and welcomes him back into the family. This is another example of someone not being concerned about the social norms of the day, but being willing to express love, to being willing to um, pursue Jesus, to live like Jesus. And if it embarrasses them, so what? They don't really care. So Zacchaeus is up the tree. Jesus is coming with this huge crush of people. And by the time that Jesus gets to the sycamore tree, gets to where Zacchaeus is, he looks up and he sees them. And we don't know how, but he knows Zacchaeus' name and he calls out to him and says, Zacchaeus, come down for I am going to go to your home today. So here's where the story really gets interesting. So Zacchaeus comes down from the sycamore tree and he and Jesus begin to interact. And so as all these people have been around, again, they're not all separated and partitioned out. 
but they're all there together. When Jesus says this to Zacchaeus and begins to interact with him, it says that the people begin to grumble, that they begin to grumble. And I know we can think of grumbling a lot of different ways. It's like, ugh. Or is it, you know, sort of, a, you know, looking at the side of their eye or whatever it is and smirking or whatever. But in looking at the Greek word that's used here, which again, the, the, old, or the New Testament, excuse me, was originally written in ancient Greek. The literal translation here for grumbling um, would be better understood as smoldering discontent. So the people are really kind of fuming that Jesus is interacting with this person, that he's interacting with someone who is seen as so terrible and such, just a really horrible person. Why is it that Jesus is giving him any attention? So in this, there's a real question. I mean, these people are here to see Jesus, and so they view him positively. And so it, it's likely that, you know, they're not thinking less of Jesus because he's interacting with them, at least some of them, the Pharisees and others may. But it's, who is this person to be claiming Jesus's attention? Who is this person to be here? Um, he doesn't belong here. He's not one of us. He's not worthy of this. He's not worthy of Jesus. He's not worthy of the Messiah. Why is this even happening? And then what's fascinating, and I believe that probably the, the central part of this entire story happens for us in verse eight. Now, let me read it to us again. So in the New Revised Standard Version, which is the version that Pastor Stephanie read for us, it says, Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. What becomes the real central aspect of this entire story is this particular part where it says, I will give to the poor. Now, the NRSV translates it that way. The original Greek word is didomi, and didomi can mean I will give or I give. It can be translated either way. There are other translations of the Bible that translate it differently. Let me read those to us, just a couple examples. So the RSV says it this way, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. The New King James Version says, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. The Comish English Bible says, Look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor. Now, the, it may not seem like there's any difference there. You may not even notice anything. But the question is, is Zacchaeus saying to Jesus, because Jesus says, I'm coming to your house, that, oh, because you're coming to my home, I will now give half of what I have to the poor. And then it continues. And if I defraud anyone, I will pay them back four times as much. Or is Zacchaeus saying to Jesus, look, Lord, I give half of what I have to the poor. That makes a huge difference. The difference that it makes is, is this story talking about a chief tax collector who being told by Jesus that Jesus is coming to his house, he now all of a sudden repents and does something different with what he has or is something else going on? I think in fact, it's the something else that is. And I think we see that not when we take this scripture in isolation, but we look at it in the theme of what's been happening throughout Luke. Now bear with me, but what I think is happening here is something entirely different. I think what's going on here, and, and I'm not the one who came up with this. I mean, there are plenty of other theologians and biblical scholars who have put forward this idea, who have helped me to see it, is that Jesus is not primarily interacting with Zacchaeus here for Zacchaeus' sake. I think the primary audience for all of the words that are being said here by Jesus for this entire interaction is for the sake of those who are grumbling because they believe that Zacchaeus is not worthy of Jesus' time or attention or that he's not worthy of being a follower of Christ. Now, in the last couple of scriptures, we have seen a number of instances of parables that Jesus tells about rich people who don't get it right, about people who have their wealth, who have their money, and they use it for their own benefit. They love money and they don't love people. They use people for the sake of money. But I think here with Zacchaeus, we see the opposite of that. 
We see someone who is clearly seen as unworthy, as someone who is seen as an outsider, as seen as someone who is clearly beneath um, the rest of the community that's there. But I think what we see in this person is faithfulness. What we see in them is them actually doing that thing that we have seen throughout the Gospel of Luke in putting Jesus as first in their life and thus having everything else affected by it. Now, part of what informs this is something that happens all the way back in Luke 3. Uh, You may not remember, you may not know, but at that point in the very early part of the gospel, right after we've heard about Jesus's conception and birth, when we jump ahead to Jesus's adult years, when he's in his 30s, his early 30s, we hear about John the Baptist, who, as Luke tells us, is Jesus's cousin. And John comes out and basically wakes people up. He knocks them out of their slumber, figuratively, of course, so that they can be open and able to receive Jesus and to hear what it is that he's having to say. And so John the Baptist, excuse me, is out proclaiming that people should repent, should turn away from what they're doing and turn towards God, that they should be baptized and repent of their sin. So there's an interaction that happens in Luke chapter 3, and let me read it for us now. So beginning in verse 7, it says, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. And listen to this. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what must we do? He, John the Baptist, said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked, and what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone that th- by threats or false accusations and be satisfied with your wages. So even as early as chapter three, as Luke tells the story, John doesn't tell them quit being tax collectors. He doesn't tell them quit being soldiers. What he tells them is when you function in this way, when you have these roles, do it in an ethical way, do it in a Christ-like way. And then it also mentions there, you may have noticed about, you know, you can't just claim on being children of Abraham. You can't just claim of having this ancestor. And because of that, that makes you right with God. If we jump back to the scripture reading in chapter 19, verse 9, Jesus says to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. It's not coincidental that Jesus says this. I believe Jesus is not only affirming the good and righteous work that Zacchaeus is doing, but most importantly, what I believe is going on here is Jesus is showing, Jesus is telling all of those who think that some are unworthy of God, who are unworthy of God's favor and God's attention, that they absolutely are. Jesus ends this interaction by what he says in verse 10, where it says, For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. Again, I don't think he's telling Zacchaeus that for his sake. I think he's saying that so all these people around, these good and faithful people, at least as they think of themselves, to remind them that Jesus comes for us all. That Jesus came into this world and continues to come through the Holy Spirit for the sake of all of us. And that when we think of ourselves as better than others, as we think of others being unworthy or undeserving of God's love or God's attention or God's blessing or God's spirit or whatever it might be, that when we do that, we miss the point. And if you watch the sermon from last week, you'll know that that was the exact point that Jesus was making again, which is why I believe he's making it again now so that we will really hear it. So I know this is a lot, and I appreciate you sticking with me through this. But I think what Jesus is really trying to help us to appreciate and understand 
is that if you're a person who feels like because of whatever you've done or whatever's happened to you, that you're beyond the love of God, that God could never possibly love or accept you, that that's just not true. That's just not the case. We don't see that in the Gospels. We don't see that anywhere, anywhere. And if you're a person who really considers yourself to be self-righteous and that you do good and great things and how proud God must be, and if you're a person who feels like you do really well at this whole church and Christian thing, and that's great if you do, but if that leads you to elevating yourself up at the expense of putting other people down and separating you from them, that that's missing the point. And the truth of the matter is, is that we're all on either end of that spectrum, depending on the day and depending on what it is that we're experiencing. What Jesus is telling us in this is that he loves us and that he came into this world and he lived and preached. He died and he was resurrected for all of our sake. And as Luke tells us about him, what he wants from us is no matter who we are, no matter where we are in our lives, no matter what it is that we do, that we're called to put him first. And to remember that to do so doesn't mean that we can't do other things, but it means that all those things should be affected and influenced by prioritizing Christ in our lives. So with that, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, help us to be able to understand who you are, to be able to receive the love that you have, not just for us as individuals, but for all people, and to remember that in all things that you call us to follow you, to be willing to put you as first in our lives, and then to allow that decision, that choice, to continue to affect everything else. So that how we relate to other peoples, how we function in our jobs, how we treat the world around us, that in all of these things, that we would seek to do it in such a way that it shows your love, your care, your compassion, your justice, your righteousness, all of these things. Give us the wisdom to be able to see this. Give us the clarity to be able to know what that looks like and what it doesn't. And give us the strength that we need to be able to live that way when it's easy and especially when it's difficult. And as we pray all of these things, gracious God, we also pray together saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Each time we gather for worship, we are reminded of how blessed we are by God. And so it is out of gratitude and with thanksgiving that we give back to God a portion of what we have received. You can do that today with your financial giving by going to glendalefirst.org. With that, let us pray. Lord, how can we thank you for such wondrous love? You have covered us with blessing and sustained us with hope. Most of all, you have given us your very self for our life and the life of the world. In gratitude, we bring our gifts for the sake of those you love. In Jesus' name, amen. So don't forget if you're in the Glendale area and are looking for ways uh, to be more intentional about living out your faith, we've got the opportunity coming up tomorrow on Monday to help go serve breakfast at North Valley Caring Services. Also, we have the number of new Bible studies and other opportunities that are coming up as well. And of course, you wanna find out more information about all of these, you can go to the links below in the description or just go to our website, glendalefirst.org. So as we go forth from this time, and as you go back to your life and whatever waits for you there, I encourage you to remember the message that Jesus gives us in the scripture, that none of us are beyond the love of God, that God loves all of us and calls us to follow him, and that in doing so, it means to make him the most important thing in our life and allow that decision to affect everything else we do. In the name of God, the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer, amen.